So, good morning, committee. Um, thank you, everybody, for your attendance last night. I thought it, um, yeah, thank you. Um, that went, went well. And uh, so, this morning, um, as it says on the schedule, we're going to have committee discussion um, on 610. We finished our testimony uh, yesterday. And um, so, what I'd like to do, and we don't have Eric Eric in the Senate. Um, okay. okay, all right, well, we'll, we'll take notes. Um, committee discussion, I'm going to go section by section. We're not, we're not taking any votes. We might do, you know, straw poll that would we'll sort of see how the committee goes, but just want to... Um, so we're on 7.1? Yes, <coughs> yeah. And um, <coughs> right, so um, the Vermont Police Association, Beth went through her cheek considered technical um, uh, amendments yesterday. I'm going to put those to the side for now because I, I just think that they're confusing to try to put every word in, and, you know, especially considering that they are more technical. I think we can really look more at the substance of the bill, um, you know, again, section by section. Um, so everybody have what they need in front of them in terms of the copy and a clean copy or okay. and um, <coughs> if anybody needs the bill as introduced or not but um, anyway so okay so the first section is section one and background checks and this is what we've been referring to as the default <coughs> proceeds uh, when the bill started um, it didn't have any um, any date, any time um, mentioned. Um, I threw out 90 days because from testimony I, I heard that after 90 days the FBI doesn't really do anything. Um, to need to hear testimony that that was still a very long time. I knew that other states had 30 days and I threw that out. So here we are. You looking for discussion on it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I this this section is, is is one that I think is kind of the most. Um, this one is the section that I get hung up with the most in the bill. Um, so I'll start off by saying I'm kind of an agnostic on guns, which means that you know most people sitting around the room have disagreed with me on some point because I've voted for some gun restrictions and against others over time. Um, and I think the key for me has always been that when making some of these decisions, um, we make a lot of choices around privileges, <coughs> restricting privileges and things like that. And I think that's an important piece. I think. There are very few things in uh, life that are actual rights. And so I think that the bar gets higher when you want to um, touch rights. And you know, I know that we've heard quite a bit of information from people saying that you, you don't touch rights. And I don't agree with that. I think that there are very clearly limitations of rights that can be put on um, you know, different different things in the Bill of Rights. Uh, and I think the courts have shown that. Um, but I do think the reason for that has to be extremely compelling. And the problem that I have with this section, I think, is that I'm, I'm, I keep coming up very short of compelling <coughs> reasons for it. Um, I will say that in future sections of the bill, I think that there's some merit to but there's a good amount of merit to some of the discussions that are going on in other portions of the bill, but I do feel that section one almost um, poisons the ability to have that discussion. Uh, so I'll, I'll say that you know I am not a Second Amendment person. I don't own a gun. I have in the past. I, one of my favorite facts about myself is that I lost my gun in my divorce. Um, fun fact. But. Um, I don't ever intend to take advantage of the Second Amendment. But that being said, I believe very strongly in 
some of the other amendments that are there, and I do utilize them and want to defend them often. Um, I think back to the abortion debate that we had last year, uh, when we were essentially debating what many felt was a right and others thought was um, was you know a, a, a privilege that could be a bridge, and. Overall, my hope is that we will um, be very careful when going after rights. One of the main things that I've heard against this bill is that you know rights shall not be infringed, or and I, I think that's a, a that's a faulty argument. I also think that one of the things that we've heard in favor of the bill is if it saves just one life, it's worth it. Um, and I also think that's problematic in a lot of ways. Um, saving a life is very important, but I think it's saves, it starts down a dangerous precedent of what is the threshold for removing rights. I, again, think back to the abortion debate and think that many people in the room pushing against that right would have said if it saves one life, it's worth it. And I just worry that in the situation that we're in right now, um, it may work to say if it saves one life. But I worry about what future iterations of this body could think and what some of the dangers that we could be setting for um, protecting other rights that I think a lot of us care very deeply about, such as um, you know, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the First Amendment. These are all things that we hold very dear. So I just think that when we're looking at something that when you actually break it down by the numbers, uh, even to have a default proceed occur is twice as likely, you are twice as likely to be struck by lightning as just the default proceed to happen when you break down the numbers. And that just is not compelling enough uh, to get there. And I think that for me personally, and I know I won't be here for the final vote on this bill, um, but I can see a path to supporting some of the other stuff that's in this bill in the other sections. But with section one, I find that to be uh, essentially a poison pill, and I would like it removed. I mean, I'm not going to repeat everything that Matt said. He's gen generally a better speaker than I am. But uh, no. no, it's not true. Uh, it's not true. But I, I have felt with this very similarly that especially during uh, some of our earlier testimony people would come in and say well I I can't speak to the rest of the bill but these are my many many reasons for not liking this and uh, I felt 90 days was better than never I feel 30 days is better than 90 but I still think it's just an extreme problem for some people that I, I would agree. I, I don't necessarily see this as a significant, um, some, something that is a significant change, but it is clearly a significant problem for some people. I, I want to make sure I understand that. Can you, can you um, so explain I, your last I I don't think that the expansion in days is something that is extremely uh, I don't think it's going to be helpful enough that it's going to fix enough problems that it's going to be worth the amount of scrutiny that has been given that one section. Yeah. Something. Yeah, no, I got it. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, and um, just looking specifically at the, uh, you know, the um, the background check, the transfer time, because um, I, I do think that you know, we're, we're not a particularly large state, and I feel like nine, the year sample we had, nine instances of someone who should not have gotten a firearm being, being handed one. I, f I feel like that's a big enough number to, to deal with, to, to try and have a solution. And, you know, I know we know that um, seven of those guns were uh, reacquired by the authorities. 
two were not. Uh, that that's problematic for me. That's 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 troubling. Um, for me, I was okay with with ninety days. If there's a higher comfort level with thirty, because of the way the background check actually plays out, I have no um, concerns with changing it to thirty. I will say I don't think it needs to go any lower than that. Quite frankly, the people who are gonna hate it at thirty will hate it at ten days. Um, so at least you know there's there's other things that were added to section one towards the end that I think could have additional discussion. But as far as trying to close the uh, Charleston loophole, you know I think it is very worthwhile overall for public safety in Vermont to change that from three days to 30. Are we just talking about the, the first section to start? Yeah, we're okay. just, um, so no, no, um, you know, no both so just kind of getting a feel for um, where folks are at. Yeah. Um, I think it is important to have a time frame, whatever that is. I think the unknown is <laughs> troubling for people. But I think there still has to be some kind of confirmation that happens, even if it's the state contacting the feds. So that, because, I mean, I was trying to just look at um, some of the data. I know we've heard the Vermont data, but um, some of the FBI data said that um, more than 20% of the perceived default sales um, involved sales to prohibited individuals. So that's concerning. I mean, it, that definitely is concerning, and I'd love to just figure out a way that even after no matter how many days it is, there's some kind of confirmation. I mean, it's almost like if you didn't hear from the doctor's office how your test went, and you just assume, oh, they'll we'll call you if it goes okay, but they don't call you or whatever. Like, it's, it seems too important to not end on a, some closure. And in the cases of the FBI saying we're still, wow, we still are, it's not a duplication thing. It's th like there may be, there may be a valid reason why it's taking a long time. And it would be great to figure out. Yeah, I don't know if we, right, if we can. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. that after 90 days. So, um, starting with the constitutional issue that Matt brings up, I mean, there are lots of rights in the Constitution, and often rights are uh, <coughs> sometimes in conflict. Uh, there's sometimes competing rights. Uh, and looking at the Vermont Constitution, one of the rights, in fact, that's in the first article, Article 1, uh, is obtaining safety. Um, and, and that's what this this is seeking to do. It's, it's helping to obtain safety. Uh, and in, in particular, it does relate to the domestic violence uh, situation. Um, from the GAO report, which uh, is the best data I think we have on this, but it's, I think, from a period of time that goes to 2016, I believe. That was released in 2016. That 30% of the um, Denials based on having a misdemeanor domestic violence offense uh, are not resolved within three days. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, so 30% of denials based on uh, misdemeanor domestic violence offenses are, are not resolved within the three days. Um, I. I would be willing to go a little bit lower, frankly, than 30, uh, based on the GAO data. Uh, based on that data, uh, in 20 days, 96% of, of those domestic violence misdemeanors are resolved. Uh, the data also says that, well, the last 4% are resolved after 20 days, but doesn't give any kind of time frame for that. So it could be 30, could be 90. It wouldn't be beyond 90 because uh, the FBI stops uh, at 90 days. So I would be willing to do that because we could anchor it to, in fact, this uh, data and it's related to really what the bill is, is about. So 
It's also that it's not taking away a right. It is putting a, a, a reasonable restriction on, on a fairly small population who would be affected by this. Uh, so it's, and, and again, you have this competing right that we have in, in our state constitution. So uh, I'm still in favor of the default proceed, uh, but again, I would be willing to go a little bit lower as far as related to the data that we have. So, I mean, I, I support this section, and I just wanted to speak as somebody who owns and has purchased firearms, but also somebody who's um, very interested in maintaining public safety. I mean, if, if I have to go to an FFL and they say to me that, you know, there's another person with the name Nader Hashim, which is pretty uncommon, but there's another person named Nader Hashim, he's a prohibited person, and you have the same name, so we're going to have to wait an extra day or two to sort this out. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that, as long as it means that this other person who is a prohibited person doesn't get um, doesn't get mixed up or you know, isn't able to possess a firearm. So I'm, I'm fine with it. As in terms of 30 days or? or, or I think 30 days is fine. I, I think 30 days is fine. Um, you know, like was mentioned earlier, the people who hate it at 30 days are also going to hate it at 10 days. So um, I mean, if, if we want to bring it down to 10 days or whatever the alternative is. I just want to understand what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, good morning, Coach. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. So, Coach, we are having a um, committee discussion. Um, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so. we'll just keep on going. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, as you settle in, um, so we're, we're on the first section. And, yeah. So, I figured. See so your hand, yeah. yeah I, I had a thought, I had an opinion when we first had this bill. I know I sh should have brought it up then. Um, Patrick, it's, it's but to hear from you whenever you, whenever you want to participate. So no, no should have. But it, it is my feeling that this section of the bill, and maybe this would be a, a ridiculous thing to do, but I think both this section and the later section would have a better ability to be passable just in the general political sphere if they were separate. And I, I actually believe there are people who may, just because of this section, not support the rest of it, or maybe support the rest of it, uh, whatever the opposite of what I just said is. So, and that was a thought I had early on of maybe it should just be presented as something separate. Um, but I don't know if that's worth exploring as possible. Procedurally on the floor, I wouldn't be surprised if someone divides the question when it gets to the floor. But it doesn't change the final vote. So you may have people with an opportunity to vote for some sections. Just, just uh, some quick additional data that, you know, that there are several other states that have similar laws. In Delaware, dealers have to wait 25 days to transfer a firearm <clears throat> if there's not a resolved background check. California, it's 40 days. New York is 30 days. Utah and Florida do not allow the transfer to occur until there's a background check that is complete, so it's open-ended. I'm sorry, California. Uh, uh, California is 40 days. New York is 30 days. Utah, okay. Florida. Um, and there's other states that require a permit uh, or a license uh, for a firearm. and, and for issuance of those permits or licenses, they have there has to be a background check. It's a little more in, in depth. And for those checks, uh, there's anywhere from 10 days to six months for an individual to pass a background check. So it's really kind of all over the place as far as what states are doing. And then there are a lot of states that don't have any, obviously, at all. Um, I also support this section, and I think really, now that we, um, n now that the version that we're looking at has time certain rather than as introduced, which um, just required completion of the background check, we're really just looking at an extension of the 
period before a default proceed takes place. So it's we're not even eliminating the default proceed. We're just um, and I think I mean I would have supported the ninety days because I think that. Um, was tied really directly to testimony we heard about. Af after 90 days, it's clear like they're just they'd stop doing their work. But up until that point, um, folks could results could still come in. And but I I'll support the 30 days um, if people feel like that's a necessary compromise to move things forward. Um, I don't feel a need. I don't. I don't feel a need to go um, less than that. I understand the logic of 20 days, but I think um, 30 days is like actually clearer for people to wrap their head around. It's just a month. Um, and as others have noted, I don't think people who um, have concerns about 30 days are going to be like, oh, now that it's 20 days. I can support it. So um, I think I'd advocate for just leaving it where it is, um, or even looking at the 90-day window again. And for me, I think it just, well, I um, feel like I need to repeat what, every, what others have said, but it just, it does. We heard really clear testimony and evidence again and again that um, beyond the issue of common name mix-ups that one of the contributing factors to this is just trying to understand how um, domestic violence and really from abuse orders kind of play out and that that can be a big factor for something taking more than 30 days. So to me it's just consistent with the overall goals of this bill and um, yeah, strong, I strongly support it. And uh, one thing I don't think I mentioned earlier, I know there were concerns about federal law and supremacy clause and, and that the three days is the law, but um, you know, Eric has testified in the past that we are, as a state, able to go um, further than, than the three days, and so I just want to get that out there. Yes. Um, what, what's that mean? We're, we're a state that's able. What, what so makes we, us able? Um, we're not. Um, we're not prohibited um, by it, it, in some areas the federal law. That's it, and that's um, we can't. States are not allowed to. Oh, so it has to, to do go. with the federal law, exactly. not something here. Right. Okay. Right. So I don't know if I'm explaining it properly, yeah. but it's yeah. we're not foreclosed from doing something because of the federal law. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. And some states are. No, no, so no, in some no, instances. It depends on the federal law. Exactly. Right. It depends. Okay, okay. Exactly. Right. So in this in this particular issue, it is okay for states to come up with their own. Okay. Yeah. Article 6. Um, right. To be more, more restrictive Thank under you. states' rights. Thank you. Yeah. Because fair and impartial policing, that's what we found, you know, in those segments, you know, of the law. Was this you could be more restrictive, but less restrictive was problematic. And there's some federal laws that you can't go more restrictive. Right. So what? what, what, what yeah, I'm did, one to, example. I, I just, I I'm just. I'm just curious. Yeah. It's it's a it's a fairly complicated area of whether federal law preempts the states right. from yeah, doing something. Uh, it's federal preemption, and there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of factors they look at. Such has the federal um, government has a uh, Congress completely taken over that particular area of law, for instance. Okay. Railroads? Yeah, railroads. Like railroads are one of them? Probably that, energy, I would think, right? Yeah. Or, um, yeah, there's, yeah. I, I defer to Eric to explain which yeah. those are. But, yeah. um, so I just wanted one other point, and I just wanted to make clear for folks that under the regulations uh, for the National Institute of Criminal Background Check System, uh, the after that three-day period, uh, they continue to research the potentially prohibiting <coughs> records of somebody who's been delayed uh, regarding uh, that individual. So, and if there is definitive information that comes in that either shows the person is denied uh, or uh, that they should proceed, uh, the regulations provide that the FBI gets back to the dealer. So either way, so. 
So the twenty percent of those cases that would be resolved within ten days, as I mentioned earlier from the GAO, presumably under these regulations, uh, they would be allowed to proceed before that thirty-day period has ended. Did that make? Was that clear? I can't say whether the FBI is following the regulations or not, but that's what the regulations provide. Um, I'm going to surprise everybody and say that I want to stay at the three days, right? <laughs> um, but with reasoning, with reasoning, not just because that's what it is and, and that's where it should stay. Um, if I can spit this out. Um, the, the Charleston loophole, which I don't like that term because it's not a loophole. I look at a loophole as being something illegal, and there's nothing illegal about the default process. And and I can appreciate people's concerns over you know the the uh, the, the uh, people purchasing firearms. So they you know they end up getting them and, and then having to you know the FBI ATF having to go through their process to uh, get the guns back. I can appreciate all that, the concerns, you know, that Will brought it up with the, with the two that we don't, you know, we're not exactly sure what happened with them. Um, but with that said, uh, the, the way that I see it, and I'm going to say Charleston loophole, that this has all come about because of the Charleston loophole, which is one case. And that's not one case in Vermont, that's one case nationally and we're talking through the years, potentially billions of, of transactions. And, and even depending on who you talk to and the witnesses you listen to, some say that person got the gun illegally and some say he, they didn't get it illegally. So, it, and it kind of goes back to, I think what, what Matt had said is, is for me is, is changing a law because of one case. And, 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 uh, and, and to me, a, a case with, with some gray area. Um, that's it. So, yeah. oh, so uh, just in response to that, I, my, my main motivation is, in fact, uh, not the Charleston loophole, not what happened in Charleston, but the data that really from that GAO report was eye-opening that 30% of the misdemeanor domestic violence offenders uh, are missed within uh, that three-day period. Uh, so that's really my motivation uh, for trying to give the FBI more time to sort those particular potential prohibitions out. So, Martin, is the data of the GAO report after it's mixed or before it? It is before Fix Nix. Yeah, Unfortunately, I, there is some data related to Fix Nix, and I've asked some <laughs> questions about that. Um, and it's not entirely clear that this is going to resolve the issue with respect to misdemeanor domestic violence assaults. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was focused on some other areas where there were deficiencies in getting data into the Nix system, is my understanding. Right. And making it consistent so that, you know, things trigger when they should. Right. It, I don't, I mean, I'll look a little closer, but it, it's not my understanding that it is addressing uh, the 50 states different ways of describing simple assault that could be domestic violence related. Uh, I don't believe it, it fixes that component. Okay. Coach and Barbara. Okay. Um, I um, would stand in support of uh, the extended time. Uh, what I'd like to propose uh, would be adding uh, just a, a, a detail. Uh, listening to Jeff Wallen, uh, who is uh, our director uh, of uh, information for DSP, <coughs> and our repository, and then listening to the testimony over the last few weeks, there are folks, you know, who have a uh, a concern uh, 
about our data reporting. So what my suggestion might be is, is that being that we have one point uh, of reference here in the state, that we ask for uh, annual updates, you know, from uh, that entity, Jeff, or whoever's in that seat at that time, uh, for how the data is moving from the court to the system. Because he's in charge of all of that data, you know, and how it moves between the federal system and our judiciary system. So in order to ensure that that information is accurate and up to date, because that's one of the questions that you know came up time and time again, well, fix the problem. I'm not gonna just say that uh, it's automatic, uh, but this way we'd have a way of uh, uh, cross-checking to make sure that um, Things are changing uh, because he was really good as far as answering the questions about Nix and getting us additional data from the FBI. You know, in a, like a two-week period, uh, he extended the information and the answers that we requested, uh, and uh, you know, I think that that might be a helpful way to approach it. Thank you. And when you say that you support the extended time. Uh, you know, the 30 days. So the 30 days, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm just teasing Martin. It wasn't me. <laughs> I wasn't me. I, I, your last day, I, I imagine that. Uh, a lot of teasing to do. Oh, we're in the beginning. <laughs> so, the Charleston loophole is not a one time, I think that's a myth, it's a misnomer. Um, there were a number of cases that um, it happened with. So the Aurora, Illinois case, the church massacres in Sutherland in Springs, what, what Texas. In Aurora? It was a That was the movie theater, right? I think so. I can get you the details. Um, Virginia Tech um, was that situation. Um, Westerly, Texas, this past summer was that situation. Um, they there was another one people. in um, Pease Park. Um, that Barbara, um, Th those were all prohibited people? Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to share what the circumstances were of how they... Um, yeah, that's what I was asking about Aurora. But in, in these cases, um, nothing came back after three days for the Pease Park one. Aurora, I'll have to give you more details because that one is just referenced as... Um, people who slipped through the cracks and there are deadly consequences. Oh, so Aurora was a uh, workplace shooting. Yeah, but why, why, was he, why was the person who struck him? I will get you that answer, but it sounds like what it, okay, actually, you know what it'll say here. So basically, these are all ones where um, the default time went into effect and the person wasn't Cleared. So I'll right, get you the exact right. issue. I'll but, get you that exact issue. This right, is but everything but Aurora. The, the, do any of the cases you have in front of you, does it say why the person, were they restricted or it just went past the three days? Um, they were restricted and it was past the three days. Right, but it, those articles don't say why they were restricted? Um, one does. Um, and I'm certainly happy to this around the military had fallen short in one case of forwarding records. Um, that's which, the Texas one. That's the Texas yeah. one. Yeah. Um, but that's not. That's not no. this, but it that's, would. Yeah, that's, that's not, not the loophole. Um, so, right. yeah. yeah, so I'll give you the details yeah. on those. Okay. How, how is that not the loophole if they're supposed to forward the records? to make it clear that he is a prohibited person. Because no one, because you could have a time limit of however long you want. You would not catch a person by that. I mean, they didn't have the records. It wasn't the, the records in the system. So the rec the In the next system? Correct. Was that's the system. A, that was the issue, and that's one of the, I believe that was one of the triggers for Nick's Right. Yeah. 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 And in this other case, the criminal charge was filed in Austin, not in Houston, and so they didn't check. Um, 
for that information didn't come through till a few days later. Oh, right, yes, did I say Colorado? Okay, it's Aurora, Illinois, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. There's a mistake with the number. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. where it says, so right. you're at it's three, four. So on page, page three, line 20, 20 is what we're talking about. Okay. And um, through line uh, two on page five. We're taking that out. Um, that's well, there, um, this is up for discussion. Oh, and okay. I, I have, I can say for myself, I have very grave concerns after listening to um, yeah yeah um, after especially after listening to the attorney general's office uh, testimony you know sure um, you know, attorneys will differ and we can never say you know, absolutely but I for me he raised enough concern that um, that I would like to see it out um, I, I wasn't sure if we really needed it, and maybe there's some language that can, you know, reiterate that law enforcement has the authority to um, help the court you this. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but anyway, so that's where I'm starting from, but certainly others. Yeah, yeah there's one question. Well, I'm sorry, the attorney general going to get back to us on. What was that around? I'm sorry, what? There was one question the attorney general, the general's office was going to get back to us on. I don't think they've cleared it the higher ups yet. Does anyone remember there was a question that yeah. on, this on this section? I, I, I asked him, I proposed some language, and I yes, said, that was it. You know, how would you feel like this is on Okay, so it's not a piece said, of a gotcha. Okay, yeah, I didn't know if it was a bit of information that we needed for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there was a, an, another question that. I think he was going to get back to a sound that I brought up, brought up was, uh, I mean, I found it interesting that somebody could be charged with a felony for impeding a, in a civil case, and I asked if there was any other uh, uh, laws that, that did that, and, and uh, he wasn't sure. I don't know if he's going to get back to us or not, but I think so I, I, I found that real interesting myself, so. I think it's a misdemeanor, though. Yeah, Where the, the, the new criminal misdemeanor. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but the impeding, but for impeding on a civil uh, issue, you can be charged with a two-year felony, shall be in prison for two years, or fined. I think we have, yeah. Yes. I, don't, I don't think that is uncommon, but anyway, other, anybody want to advocate to keep this in? So, I guess I have a question. So. A violation of a protective order. What, what's the what's the uh, that offense? Is that a misdemeanor offense? Violation of a protective order. Yeah, mm -hmm. like a violation of a release of abuse order. I mean, yeah, it was, it was a misdemeanor. The first so, time or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second time. It so there are there are two ways to get at there, the way I separate this out is is the process of getting the firearms relinquished from the individual subject to the order. And then there's the separate situation of the law enforcement controlling the environment, other individuals, for instance, being at the location. You know, putting that one aside. The first one, I think we already have that handled by what we are asking or requiring the court to put into the order, which is on page seven, 
uh, it's requiring the defendant to relinquish the firearms pursuant to the instructions of law enforcement officer, uh, which we do have the definition of the instruction of law enforcement officer back on page five, which is in part repeated in the order uh, language that we're requiring on the bottom of page seven, <coughs> requiring the defendant to provide the location of the firearms, this, the keys, etc. So if the individual does not follow the instructions of the law enforcement officer, which is giving the law enforcement officer the discretion to, to re try to re you know, receive the firearms right when they go and, ser and serve, or uh, we'll be back in the next day with the U-Haul, or we're going to wait until I get back, or whatever, There's a, you know, it gives the discretion for the law enforcement officer to control the relinquishment situation, but also uh, requ uh, creates the requirement that if not followed, could lead to a violation of the abuse of uh, the, the relief from abuse order. So, I think we are without this impeding, we have that covered as far as giving law enforcement discretion and the authority to get the relinquishment done in a safe manner, taking into consideration logistics. The other part is this, what we're dealing with here in the impeding, which is the other individuals who may be around and such, and I think that's what you're working on language with. Yeah, can, can I speak to sure. that? Sure. So this, as far as I know, originally came in to address officer safety at a scene like this, and as it is currently when cops are at a scene and they know that guns are involved, it's yeah, it's on it's you know red alert. It's it's not like anybody's messing around. There's no leniency, and people are being controlled at a scene because you, you just don't mess around with that, and you don't get complacent in that sort of scenario. And we, you know, heard the example of being able to control somebody when they're on the other side of the room versus when they're in your face. And the reality is, is that when that person is on the other side of the room, they're going to be controlled by that police officer. And there, there's really, yeah, there's really no other way around it. Um, so I, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm not too concerned about having this in the bill as it is because it, it's not really necessary because cops are going to control that scene. So you don't think we have to have the impeding, new impeding offense? No, I don't think we need to have a new impeding offense. I think it would help you know, if, if the concern is having language in there that makes it clear that officers can control a scene, then we can include language that says, you know, when police are executing this order, they have the ability to control people's freedom of movement, which they already do. But if we're putting that in there just to put their minds at ease, I guess, then then okay. But. Yes, yeah, I was going to ask, what's what's the existing law on that? I mean, impeding an officer. Part A was existing. Part right. B was what we added. But yeah, is, does that? Yeah, I mean, if you're you're asking you, what control about control, what's the? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if if, if we already have it in existing law, it makes to me it makes no sense to put it in again. But other than as a reminder, yeah, I mean, I I can't speak to the precise law off the top right. of my head, but I can speak to what actually happens, which is right. when you know, you're what at, they teach you at the academy or what whatever. What they teach you and what actually happens right. is that if you're in a house, there's several people and there's guns around the house, all you're going to be in control of those people. You're going to be able to see their hands. And if they're not listening to you, they're going to go in handcuffs or they're going to sit in the back of somebody's cruiser. Yeah. That's that's what happens. Right. So. You're saying if you go into that house, one person, or are you going to wait for a lot of backup? Because one person, I don't think, is going to control that, and you're going to end up dead. If it's one person, well, I, one, officer. It, one scenario, one officer. I mean, yeah, each scenario is different, but <clears throat> it's one trooper, one officer versus a house with five people in it, and there's guns all over the house, you're, you're waiting for backup. Yeah. So you're not going to go in that house before you got plenty of backup, right? No. E even with the execution of these orders, you're supposed to go with two police officers. Um, in the execution of RFAs, as it is currently, you're supposed to take somebody else with you. All domestics, you're supposed to take at least one other trooper or another police officer. 
sometimes more. Um, and yeah. So I was, man. Yeah, sure. So I wasn't going to weigh in a lot in, until after we're done. But this section here really, really gives me concerns. The lack of 24/7, uh, 365 uh, police coverage, and all this stuff. The um, the situation could get worse. I'm gravely concerned about police officers. I'm also concerned about innocent people that might be in that house, and uh, and also what more it it would. Uh, what possibly could happen to uh, make the situation much worse, and uh, I, I still have a lot of questions on this on this part here. Yeah, I'd a lot of concerns, <coughs> not questions. A lot of concerns. Yes. Maybe, maybe it was better as a question for testimony, but uh, at least as far as I'm with uh, my experience in firefighting. When you show up on a scene, you control the scene because you're called to it. Uh, but this isn't going to be something that you're like dispatched to. You're not reporting to a scene necessarily. This would be more like an order to go do this. Is that still the same jurisdiction of controlling the scene in that sense? Or? If you're going to a house and there are people and there are guns, you're going to control the movement of those people. That's that's what happens on the road. So then I I'm not sure we need extra clarifying language if there is existing. So yeah, I, I will ask another of this as well from your experience. Uh, again, looking at page five where we're uh, defining instructions of a law enforcement officer, including uh, related to the time, place, manner, and conditions of relinquishment, at least. At least I've interpreted that, that that gives that law enforcement officer just a lot of discretion to determine how that's going to happen and when that's going to happen as far as the relinquishment. So in other words, we're not saying you immediately have to do this in an unsafe manner. You know, the law, I trust that the law enforcement officer is going to exercise discretion to do it in a safe manner. And this definition makes clear that the defendant has should be complying with with the law enforcement officer's instructions related to that exercise of discretion. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Is there a question? Well, I, I mean, wondering, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if, if, if my understanding of that is, is, is correct if, um, from your perspective. I have, I have to get back to you on. I have to yeah, ponder that a little bit. Think more about what you're asking. Um, well, I want to make I want to make clear to, to law enforcement <coughs> that when, when they're serving the order and determining how to relinquish, it's completely in their discretion to figure out how best to do it with respect to safety and respect to logistics. That's kind of one point. Point, but also that the defendant understands. Uh, you know, the, the, it says you have to relinquish your firearms. Uh, they're not going to say, stand at the door and say, yeah, come in and get my 50 firearms right now. The law enforcement officer thinks that, no, that's not safe. I'm, you know, we're going to have to have more backup or whatever. But it, and it ties the defendant to the, the fact that he or she has to follow the law enforcement instructions on how to relinquish. You know, they get the order that says immediately relinquish. And they say, well, yeah, here you go. Law enforcement's not ready to do that. You know, they have to follow law enforcement instructions. I, anyway. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's. But I think, yeah. And I think we can talk about that when we look at section four. I think. I think well, right it's, it's, we it's within the, uh, uh, the, the uh, definition section. Right. And I'm just wondering if that's given enough coverage. If we take out impeding? Yeah, if we take out the, the impeding. Where, where are you seeing the immediate relinquishment? Well, that's I'm not seeing the word that's immediate. In the order. That's, that's in the order on, on page <coughs> seven, no, the yeah. bottom of page uh, six, that absolute <coughs> final order, similar language, and require the immediate, rel uh, immediate relinquishment. Uh, I, I, yeah, but concerned that we're confusing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. that we need to just stick to yeah. the impeding. Yeah. And, Coach. No, that's all I was going to say is, is that 
you know, it, it appears that we're talking about redundancy of process and procedure. Um, because in talking with um, our sheriff on Monday uh, and our chief on Monday, um, like Nader shared with us, they determine process and procedure for their officers based on their training and experience at the scene. Uh, so, you know, what is our intent? You know, is it to be redundant, you know, or is it to just create more confusion in a way? And so that's, um, Great. that's the and concern. I, yeah, and I think not only, well, for me, this goes beyond redundancy. I mean, mm. sometimes it's okay to be redundant, no, no, but, no, but this no. is, yeah, right. so. Yeah, I think that you know, going back to the idea of introducing language that provides some clarity and I guess more confidence because, you know, in the back of every cop's mind is, all right, these actions that I'm taking, am I going to get sued for this? Mm -hmm. And then the other section is, am I going to make it home tonight? That's, that's the other part. And so there are often times or confusing gray areas where, you know, they may be wondering, can I do this without getting a complaint filed? Or, you know, how do I go about this without inadvertently violating somebody's rights? And having language that makes it clear and makes it certain that, you know, at a scene like this, you do, in fact, have the authority to control people's freedom of movement, I think, would be helpful. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. And you're working on that with Eric? Yes. Okay. I, I also have a concern that, you know, well, <coughs> there, there's, there's this fear that some cops may have of, that, that causes them to be hesitant uh, because they may be at risk of being sued or having a complaint filed. And the last thing that you want to see is a cop who's hesitant because they don't know the rules and it's not written anywhere. And so they so they hesitate and then they end up getting hurt. So so I think having language that would clarify that would be good. See push the um, and I guess that's what you know Chief and uh, the sheriff were referring to and uh, that Clarifying procedure is one thing. Creating another law, crime. you know, uh, or another uh, crime uh, wasn't necessary, and I guess that was the difference. Okay, great. Yeah, and yeah. So, uh, from what I heard, I I think somewhere this is written in law already, right? I mean, I'm I would assume at this point, and, and I didn't know if just a reference back to. What's already written? If we could, if if, if what we have already is sufficient. And Beth was referring. To, I, I can't remember the top of the head, but she was making some references as to how and why cops are able to control a scene. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm speaking more of just of what I was doing on the road yep. versus the exact case law or the um, statutes, so I can. Practice policy training versus what we might find in the green book. Right. But I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. So. But we still could capture it. I would yeah. Think. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking whatever is the easiest way to. Yeah. To get it done, whether it's referring back or yeah. you know adding something or. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for Nader. Does anything else rise to the level of um, guns when you said? Law enforcement takes it pretty seriously when they're going in somewhere. I'm assuming like explosives or something, but knives. I mean, <laughs> weapons in general. I mean, okay. if, if there's a weapon, then can't think of a better analogy, but or metaphor. But when there's a weapon, the gloves come off, and the scene is going to be controlled. So if, like, for some, for example, if somebody's standing in a kitchen, you're going to get that person out of the kitchen because that's actually the most dangerous place to have. A witness or a suspect because it's filled with weapons. Um, yeah, does that? It, it's helpful because I guess I was 
thinking that if it's that, um, which I get, if it's that um, intense for law enforcement to go in, it sort of speaks to sort of the need for doing something, whatever that is that we're trying to do in this bill, right? Like we know it's people who are like really volatile and have weapons. So, right, because there are other calls that you go on that you're not, law enforcement is not as um, concerned, right? As I mean, the DV ones seem to rise to some well, I mean, in, in theory, you're supposed to always be observant and aware of your surroundings, but in reality, you know, if you're going to, if you're responding to the school because two kids are pushing each other around, you're not going to be as on high alert as if you're responding to a stabbing. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. But you, in theory, you're supposed to be uh, constantly observant. Yeah. I think... Uh, if I remember correctly, I, I heard at a certain time of day that there's only so many state troopers that are on duty at that time. And even though a lot of people think Vermont is not that big of a state, when you're trying to get from point A to point B, and I don't think troopers usually have the ride-along program together where their buddy system is, is uh, working, on top of that, you put the extra load on the municipalities that aren't there. I don't see I can I I have a concern that uh, the dangers probably could have already happened and I just really, really strongly believe that we're putting officers' lives more and more in danger. Um, we don't have the capacity um, with law enforcement uh, to enact a lot more of this right now. This this section is, I have a lot of concerns with it. Just one question, Margaret. Um, so what you, you said you're working with Eric on some, some language. So yes. it's just, what you're working on is more clarification uh, for what can already be done um, yeah. and not, but still but get, not get rid of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And that, that <laughs> clarification is sometimes what's needed for sure. some cops. Okay. When they're, if they're hesitant or if they don't have recent training or if they're newer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. That's so. So I think what I'm hearing is, let's take it out and mm -hmm. have some clarification language. Yeah. Different yeah. language, yeah. I, I would support that. Yeah. I'm going to pull it up. So the next section is section, labeled section okay. 2 on page 5, line 20. Is that where we're going next? Um, well, we haven't we haven't spoken so um, we haven't spoken about much about the um, the definitions. Martin referred to it a little bit, but um, I just want to make it clear that that is not coming out. That my understanding is that that is needed. Um, What's so section four, four page five. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. It shows up for the other section four. I'm not sure how <laughs> well, I know that the judge was suggesting that, you, that uh, what's on page five, the definition, and what's then on page seven, uh, which kind of reiterates part of the definition, that is redundant and is not necessary. I disagree with that because I think that we need the definition in here, and I think we need to alert the uh, defendant of uh, his or her obligations under the, that definition of what relinquishment is. So I would say we need both of those. Right, and I, uh, that's why I asked the, the gentleman who was testifying, he kept on saying form over substance and, you know. He said what now? Form over substance, yes. and I remember from law school, it's, you know, it, it's, not, it's not substantive, it's just, it was more. But, um, and I do think that he was concerned about the forms getting too long, but one of the things about 
about this bill is that if this bill does pass, um, <coughs> we have heard that the um, that the state has the technical grant and forms would would be something that that um, that Vermont that we would get assistance on to look at the grants. I mean, to look at the forms, to make sure that they are, um, you know, usable, get the right information, and so. Um, and I think that's you know one of the goals of this bill is to make sure that all those involved have the information um, that they need and that they're not getting out. So I, I do think that they should stay in. Yeah. Just structurally in this section, um, I, I agree with everything you said about the definition of relinquishment of a firearm staying in. I think in subsection E, the definition about instructions of a law enforcement officer mm -hmm. Um, unless I'm missing something in the section on the orders, I believe that really does just point back to the proposal around the um, the the proposal to create a you know misdemeanor for impeding in the language that's reflected there. So I guess I would just want to note that we should true that up with whatever matter is working on. I don't think there's other parts of the bill or the chapter, um, unless I'm missing something, where we point to instructions of a law enforcement officer and then we'll require okay, so it. Okay, questions on lines uh, 13 and 19, 19 on page 5. Does it only relate to the impeding or does yeah, it? Yeah, is there, are there other places? Page I mean, I guess we can. Uh, page 7 at line 16, 17. Oh, okay. Efforts. Yep, you're right. I and apologize. There's another, there's another place for the emergency order that is also referenced. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Nope. Yeah, page 9. Wait a second. No, not page 9. Page 10, line 3 and 4. Okay. Got it. Okay. Anybody else on page five? Okay. Um, so I, I guess yeah. I would ask about the three different places that it does talk about <laughs> relinquishment. I guess I don't understand the difference between the, the three different Places. It's, it's all basically the same language that says the same thing. What were you speaking, talking about? Now? So you're on page five. Uh, five, seven, and ten, where it talks about relinquishment. That may be a question that's better to ask when Eric's in the room, right? For the necessity of it, rather than trying to. Well, the, I think the definition on page five is a little broader than what we're asking for in the order. And we're asking for this language to be put in the order specifically to inform the defendant of their obligations under the order, rather than just leaving it to the defendant having to understand what the definition is in the statute. Would, would the defendant be understanding it or probably their their counsel would no because if there's no counsel at that point that's right next thing uh, just thinking about Tom's you know Tom's question in, a, in thinking about some of the testimony from uh, just all of the, the different folks at different points and depending on the nature of the order, that's where some of that clarity, you know, like comes. You know, like if the if it's determined by the court, you know, that when the question is asked, you know, are there, you know, weapons involved or it comes to the attention of the of the court that there are weapons involved, that's when that condition to vacate like it uh, on page nine, uh, where it's the order includes a relinquishment or a requirement to vacate, you know, is, is clearly stated in the order. 
Um, so it is a case by case, and depending on the information the court gets, at least that's no court law. Right. Also, again, because we we're looking at the final before the. Right. We'll see the way, this, the way the statute is going yeah. to be, that's what you're saying. So. And, and it does speak directly to the defendant, you know, understanding the art, you know, because that's, yeah. that's there as well. Okay. Okay. Um, let's take a break and then we'll continue with this. Yep. Eric. Eric. Okay. So we are, so that thing is, um, I think it's easier to start with the emergency first. In the file, even though it's, the, it's not like that in the books, but if other people can agree. In the page eight. <coughs> yep. Um, okay, so in terms of what was introduced and where we are now, a lot has a lot has changed. If you remember, we had we had civil warrants, we had um, once served, always served. Um, you know, in terms of these really produced sections. What we have here now is really an attempt to address the concerns of law enforcement and the judiciary. Um, for the most part, I believe. So, section, old section three. Okay, so on page eight, we have existing law, and page nine starts to talk about what the order um, shall include. And thank you. And again, you'll see at one point we have the court findings, and then we heard from the judge that that didn't work. So I think a lot of the changes here are really, like I said, responsive to, to the judiciary and to and to law enforcement and else, but and at the same time, making sure that that the court gets the information um, that is needed to make the to make the best order. Um, and um, and ensure, ensure safety. So, um, Could you just repeat what page on? Sure, nine. Yeah. So this is the emergency order. Yeah, I thought we'd start with the emergency before the. Final, but if that doesn't make sense, somebody. You now, sometimes I wonder if the statute should be reversed anyway, you know, because the emergency order in time temporarily comes first. All right. Did we decide yesterday to strike on page 10, section 5 in blue? There were some statements by Judge Grierson that it was unnecessary because you're talking about an emergency <laughs> order, and I just can't remember whether we had. I don't think we talked about that. What well, was that? I just, I'm reading through this so I understand the sections that we're talking about, but page 10, line 8. Yeah, I don't, think, yeah, I don't think we decided. We didn't make a decision no, on it. And okay. I, and again, uh, I know he said they weren't necessary, but the spray kept saying form over substance. Um, he was concerned about the forms getting too long, and I guess I don't share that concern. And I think that I think the goal is to get you know information. I think we need to get new forms, see how they work. <coughs> um, and I think we are trying to inform plaintiffs, defendants, the court of as much information as possible. I think one thing um, my notes say from his testimony is if we're going to, or I think I heard him say, if we're propose that if we're going to um, inform the defendant about the provisions relating to third party storage of firearms, <coughs> that we should inform them of all their options regarding relinquishment, which I think maybe we do now in the language of the final order and just trying to. I think that was his point that you're not going to do it on an emergency basis. Eric, 
Yeah. I recollect like that same thing. Yeah. That he thought maybe that language would be better in the final order. Yeah. Rather than the emergency. Because again, policy decision for you guys, but I, that's my recollection of what he said. That, uh, that maybe in the these are emergencies, so therefore, you know, it's going to be quick and and fast be, by nature. And that we would that we would. Um, articulate all the options for relinquishment, not just the provisions around their credit storage. Mm -hmm. That would make sense because right. the person is not necessarily even there, so they're going to be giving right. options for how to properly handle this. So there was language I think it was that Beth Novotny offered that addresses one issue. Uh, which would be in adding this yep. uh, inform the defendant of the provisions of 20 BSA 2307B1 regarding where the defendant is authorized to relinquish firearms and that the party, that third party storage of firearms is not permitted unless the court has made the findings required by 20 BSA 2307B2. Right, so if we do keep it in, have that clarifying language. That covers both, both points, I think. Does that make it any more cumbersome for the forms or anything? On top of what's what's already in here that the judge was concerned about? I just wouldn't want to add. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> I we'll want to add anymore. I, I don't think we'll know, and I don't think, and I, again, I go back to the technical assistance grant. I think that's what the grant is for, and we'll help, <coughs> and, you know, and, and we'll help address those issues. So I. So I actually think so. Listening to this, I, I think it would be helpful to put the BPA's language in there, address both points. Do we have any? <coughs> who creates the forms at this point? Court, right? The court. Yeah. Yeah. Court administrator's office. So <laughs> I think. I understand the concept of getting as much information out there. What I'm leery of is making sure that it's in a form that someone can actually look at and get the information that they <coughs> want. You know what I mean? So, uh, As we're adding more and more information, what I'm worried about is that you could actually be losing someone's focus on the information that they need to get. So just making sure that, and I know you can't really legislate this, but I think the intent is to have an easily usable form for people to get all the information they need to get that doesn't look like a terms and conditions to accept for it to go to a website thing. Right. You know, that's. Okay. I think you're right. However, I also hear that we're, the information, the forms are not capturing the information. So I. But yeah, I'm not arguing against, I understand the the purpose of, yeah. of all this. I'm just saying that my hope is that um, it's understood, as I don't think you could put this in language. I think it would be ridiculous to try, but that my, my hope is that just our conversations around the table would have anyone tasked with putting the forms together to understand that the idea is not just to get the information onto a form somewhere, but to actually make it usable, readable, and accessible to people. So at what point in the process are we when um, somebody's get, getting this information on relinquishment? I mean, are, are they at, at home um, get, getting served at that point? Or are they in a court? Or are they in, in front of, do they have a, you know, potentially a, at a minimum a public defender at that point? Um, it, it, the reason I'm going there is because if they if there is some kind of rep, representation at that point, that it seems that the representation would be telling them civil about this. They haven't been charged so, with a crime, right? So the civil but they're, right. They don't they don't have a public defender assigned to them, and they are at least in the emergency order piece of this. They are at some location somewhere being served with the order. With so they could be at their front door with we'll not or there just giving them the information. Absolutely. Okay. With the order, too. Right. You're right. Right. Mm 
Uh, you know, one of the things I, th I think that the, the court administrator uh, and uh, uh, chief judge was talking about um, was at the end of every session, they spend a very uh, large amount of time analyzing every bill that we've done and they try to clarify all of their forms and then they shared that when they did their uh, their testimony uh, just in general uh, as far as the update you know goes and with the new system that's going online uh, and a lot of the pro se uh, types of uh, work that can be done it's even more imperative that the forms <coughs> are clear uh, and in their in their detail and understandable because if if an uninformed individual is going to be looking at this document it, it needs to be clear uh, so you know I would agree with Matt you know as far as um, I know we can't legislate it per se, but you know we can share our concern that we want this to be as clear as possible. You know, uh, because you know people from you know other countries are going to be looking at it. So it's going to have to be interpreted by an interpreter, you know, for that person. So if, if the forms are <laughs> not as uh, digestible as they could be. You know, we're, we're kind of creating more of a kerfuffle than we need to. Okay. Do I remember at some point that we had one of these forms in here? We, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we did. I, I don't remember what it looked like. And on our website and let's see what I have, but yeah. Uh, we didn't have an order. We had the complaint. Or maybe we I guess it, it, it's not the return of service. It's under Carolyn Hansen. It's posted on the um, committee it's on our website. website. Yeah. So, all right. So, the, the reason I'm, I'm going there is I just wanted to see how long it was and um, just how much more confusing or whatever it would potentially be with this little bit of language. And again, um, this language came from the consensus group. Yep. Um, and I, so I think it, for the most part, would work. Um, I have a question from a technical perspective is, do you want to have it in the final order also? So it, did, it just occurred to me as I was thinking through it that um, might not be a bad idea what, whether or not you also want to repeat it in the final order. Still a question, but where it is now is in the emergency order. Mm -hmm. And as I was thinking it through, though, having in mind what we were just talking about and Judge Grierson's uh, comments on that, though, it does occur to me that because the statute in Title 20 um, permits relinquishment to a third person only if those specific findings by the court are made, and if the and in the service of the emergency order, there's not been a court hearing yet that the person's been at, so there would have been no way for the court to make those findings. So it might not be a bad idea for it to actually be just to, to remain in the emergency order, just because that way you're informing the person, oh, you can't relinquish it to a third person yet, because it has to be a court hearing where the court makes these findings. You know what I mean? It's just a notice issue, because otherwise the person might think, oh, I can't. I, doesn't the law say I can just hand them over to my uncle or something? But that's true, but the court has to make those findings first, and that hasn't had the opportunity to happen yet. Mm -hmm. just occurred to me. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, and then again with, with BPA's language. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you want it both places, though? In the emergency and the final? Yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I think what you said makes sense. sense. Right. Are you looking for comment on the section in general, or you want to take that? I'm, I'm unsure of how you're doing you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it, yes. Yeah, sorry. Let's let's move forward with um, language in both sections. Yes. And there was the additional language, Representative Long, you're referring to, which the first part of that about the the 
sort of referring to the, all the options under 2310. Yeah. I know that's in some email that I think BPA had sent. Yeah. So I want to make sure I have that. But you have, is that a hard copy you have? Uh, it's, I think it's something that's been emailed to you. I can email I did, okay. I did email that. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's yeah, mm -hmm. okay. done. Should be posted. It's not yeah, it's, it's posted. All right. Thanks. All right. So, Matt. Yeah, so I've gone back and forth on this section quite a bit, and I think that's because of the testimony. And I have found the testimony to be somewhat uh, or, or quite compelling, uh, especially in regard to the, um, the importance of acting quickly. Um, so I have a number of thoughts around this section that I think sort of uh, works towards trying to get some help in this particular area and for this time for, for um, people looking to come forward. I think the number one concern that I have is making sure that there's some check somewhere. So I think there's two sections of this bill that for me, uh, either one can happen, but both simultaneously can't happen. So I think it's either the emergency order piece requiring the relinquishment of firearms if the uh, plaintiff's complaint or affidavit mentions them, or the family, um, the family uh, piece that's in a later section. Oh, you mean the, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. It's either, I think for me, it's either one or the other because one operates as a check on the other. In my head. Yeah. In my head. Um, my, my, the way that works in my head, which is always a terrifying place for anyone who's ever tried to get in there, <laughs> is um, that for a in the instance where an emergency order is being granted, I think in that place and time, the, if firearms are of concern for that limited amount of time, there is a compelling reason, I talked about compelling reasons to, to abridge a right, and I think I can get there in this particular case for this uh, thing. But I do think that at the same time, um, one of the checks on that, and I do think it also um, is is to make sure that we're going through the uh, through the process that that currently exists of of the state's attorney bringing the um, the uh, emergency relief um, whether the request forward, and I know they're not easily connected, but I do see one as you know that it, it's. It's too broad to have both in there. Uh, the other piece I'd say is that if the, if the decision was to go the other way of having people being able to bring the, um, bring the complaint forward, I also see merit in that. But I do think that there's a problem then with, um, with not having to prove the case for removing firearms on the emergency basis prior to the final order being um, uh, being issued by the court. And I know to some that sounds a little bit um, hard to balance out, but that's how it works in my head. The couple of pieces that I do have concerns with in here that I almost wish we would change or remove uh, is on page 10, line 3 and 4, I think is absolutely appropriate. You require the person to really put the firearms. Um, but I am worried about what the ultimate ramifications of the other lines in green further down are of requiring the person to, um, to state, state that. Not as much of a concern in the emergency case because the person is not a prohibited um, person at that point by federal law. But I think when we start to get into the, um, into the, uh, the final relief from abuse order, I'm concerned about saying in here that we're requiring, based on an order, a defendant to um, admit to something that's a crime. Can, can we just on that issue real quick? But under this bill, though, the person would be a prohibited person for a temporary RFA. You know, that's one of the changes in this bill, one of the separate sections. So Right, but not for federal law. So Not federal law. Right, right. not by federal law, but you'd be creating a state provision 
Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to get more towards the the text that's in here. Um, I'm, I'm trying to bend bend where I want where I think it should go to to be as accommodating as possible. But I do, at a gut core principle, have a problem with it in both sections. Because with, you're, with, 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 that, with, okay, with with anything after line four that's in green, required that information. In, yeah. I'm fine with saying that the law enforcement officer may ask that, that or should as shall ask, but I think that there's a big difference <coughs> between that and requiring a person to admit to something that is then a crime. Well, okay. Uh, could, because the affidavit presumably says that the individual possesses or owns or controls firearms. And it is not necessarily written, but it's by the plaintiff. The affidavit would be by the plaintiff. Right. 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 Yeah. So I think the concern is, you know, fine to say to require the defendant to relinquish arms. Can we ask Eric if there's a, I mean, that's essentially a Fifth Amendment self-incrimination question. Is that... Uh, comment on that with respect to what we're looking at, uh, Eric, page 10, line 5 to 11. Mm. I wonder if it depends on the <coughs> what moment the order becomes effective. So the, the criminal prohibition is on possessing a firearm while they're subject to an order, right? Well, this would be what it's served. Served. It's served already, mm -hmm. for, so they would, would have to be subject mm -hmm. subject to the emergency order at that point. Oh, I thought this was at the moment of service. Like this it's is, being served. It's, that's part of the order. This is this would be in the order of that language requiring the defendant to do these things. Right. So the defendant has to say, <coughs> "Here's where my firearms are, and here's how many they, here's how many I have." That sort of thing. I don't know, it's an interesting question because of the timing of it. Um, because before their order is served, they're not yet in violation, right? right? Um, but they also wouldn't be asked that question prior to the order being served. Well, it's not even right. asked, it's required to defend it. They're right. They need to ask the question. So yeah. You have to do that. Yeah, I want to think about that a little bit more, I think. So flag that. Right. So can I go back to sure. the issue of the ERPO versus the relief of abuse order? Mm -hmm. right. So <clears throat> the ERPO in some respects is broader, and it, but it's also narrower. I mean, it's, it's narrower in that it does not have to, uh, the petitioner does not have to bring forth the evidence of abuse, uh, whereas for the relief of abuse order, yeah, you do have to prove that, let's see, I, mean, I got my notes here. I thought I had my notes here. Uh, and you have to, in fact, prove that there was abuse, which, if you just bear with me for one second. Yeah, so, <clears throat> and, uh, that, that there's, yeah, that there's been abuse and that there's danger of further abuse if the uh, relief or abuse order is not issued. You know, the abuse could be defined as attempting to cause or causing physical harm, placing another person in fear of imminent serious physical harm, etc. So those things have to be proven there uh, right. first. And, and it's the connection of the presence of firearms to that situation where there's a fear of this imminent serious physical harm and that there has been, you know, there has been physical abuse. Um, so I, yeah, I'm I'm aware that there's a huge inconsistency in my in right. my thing, and well, I, I understand that. It's but, just how it works, shakes out in my head. But on the but I'm saying I guess that what I'm saying is that because there's this abuse situation, right, that is what needs to be proved for you to take the next step to say firearms should not be in that situation under the ERPO, which is broader in that. It, you don't have to have that domestic abuse situation. It could be any other situation. It could be a family member worried about their brother who lives in a different house because may harm somebody. 
not an intimate partner, uh, in that situation you have to prove the imminence of that serious harm, the extreme risk of that serious harm. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit different standard that we're talking about for relief from abuse. Right. Abuse and occur, totally it different. may occur, yeah. and, we, and we're, we're making, you know, we are making the understanding based on lots of data that when you have those two situations, the presence of firearms significantly increases the risk of lethality or injury. I, I would like to treat them separately, and, and I think they are different, and I think they will be used differently. So I'd just like to focus on, on this section. And, um, So if we can go back to that, what the, the Fifth Amendment concern and such, but I the question to make sure I understand from Eric that with this language in here and when this order is served, uh, if the individual does not provide that information, the location of firearms, the keys, the combinations, other information, that would be a violation of the protective order, then, correct? Uh. <clears throat> The order is requiring the defendant to provide that information. Yeah. And if they refuse to provide it, then yeah, it, w it would not be a violation of the of the uh, categorical prohibition on the person being subject to firearms, although it could be if they have them. If they have them. But right. if you're talking specifically about the denial of the, the refusal to provide the information, yeah, that could be a violation of, of the order, right? If the order is directing them to do that. That's a civil violation, I believe. Sorry. No, I mean, that is a criminal violation. It's a violation of the order. That's right. Although, I'm thinking through that a little bit more, though, that that's true. But it's, it's difficult, again, I still want to think about this a bit more. It's hard for me to imagine that if at the moment the order is being served, let's say the person does have firearms, and the person uh, voluntarily relinquishes. So they're, in order to do that, they would have to, and they, they say, okay, they'll provide the location, the number, the locks to the fire, to the safe that I have. I don't, I don't think that would be a violation of the prohibition because they're in the process of trying to comply with the order. You know what I mean? Even though, if you think about it, for a moment, technically, they would be violating the order, I suppose, if they've been served and they still have them, but they haven't got to them yet to turn them over to the officer. I can't imagine that that would be, that it strikes me that I would have to be a due process violation for that person to then charge the person with a crime while they're attempting to comply with the order and get their firearms to turn them over to the officer who's serving them at the door. See what I mean? Right. That seems fundamentally unfair. Um, can't imagine somebody, if someone would be charged with that. Um, on the other hand, if they have firearms and they decline to provide the information, they then could be in violation of two different offenses. They'd be possessing a firearm when they're not supposed to because the order's been served. And they would have uh, disobeyed the requirement of the order, which is another crime. So in that scenario, the refusal, when does the, I don't mean to mix these issues, but uh, in what situation would the law enforcement essentially back off and then seek a warrant? I mean, is that kind of, it's been my conception that if somebody refuses at the time of, well, one of two things, if they refuse at the time of the order being served to relinquish, or law enforcement just decides because of concerns of safety and logistics that they're not going to seek to enforce that component of it. I think at that point at the door, if they still think there's still probable cause for the authority that the person does have firearms and they've either refused to, to uh, answer the question or turn them over or shut the door in the officer's face, then yeah, the officer can go back to the they get, get the warrant. Yeah, yeah. The warrant. Exactly. Cool. Right. But you're also, you're required to give that information. Correct. So, proposal, yeah. so I can say, let's say you're coming to me, one of these has been issued against me, and I say, fine, go get them. Like, I'm, but I'm not giving you the information. You go in and you, you get them. I'm giving consent so you don't need to get your search warrant. But you go and I'm still in violation of it because I'm not providing you, I'm not sitting down with an officer and going through 
serial numbers and you know makes and models or whatever it is at that point in time. I'm just saying go do it. I'm in violation of that order. It's right. a criminal offense. Right. But I'm not hindering the order from. Well, it's different. You know, the hindering is a different. Maybe you are also hindering. I don't know. I may just not want to sit down and have a conversation with the officer at this point in time about this. Yeah, most people probably wouldn't. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. But the intent was to remove the firearms, and that's being complied with. Well, yes, if the only asking for relinquishment. I mean, with this language here, there is a violation of rights. Yeah. It, it could just be my interpretation, and this may be what uh, folks are, some folks are getting at, but I see that section two on page 10 requiring the defendant to relinquish the firearms pursuant to the instructions of a law enforcement officer. If the law enforcement officer says, hey, I need to know where the firearms are in order for you to relinquish I would say that all of that would be included on the law enforcement officer's kind of extrapolation of what he's allowed to do. Maybe I'm wrong. I no, but that's a fair point. That sort of three sort of goes into more specifics about that, but conceivably uh, the instructions could include those things. You know, this is, I think by putting it, laying it out there, it may, it, the idea is that they will always include those two. You're right that it could in some situations. Yeah. Right, and I think again, in this bill tomorrow, we're trying to get some consistency. Um, as opposed to sometimes oh. the structures may include something and sometimes they may not. Mm -hmm. The predictability of the part. Oh, no, it's okay. Back over here. So, like Matt was kind of alluding to, and, and, and I did too, that I'm sure some people aren't going to be willing to maybe aren't going to want to have a conversation, I guess, at that point. So what if I uh, what if I said, you know, location of the firearms? I said they're in the house. There's the location. Keys are on the, the key rack, and the combinations are on a piece of paper somewhere. I've given you all the information you want or, or asking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you still haven't given any more information. Right. I think the, the part B to that, any other information that will assist the officer in the, would, would be the cover to that, because you would say, okay, it's in the house. Where is it in the house? You know, the follow-up being any other information. Yeah. How would, how would, sorry. I guess I'm struggling a little bit to understand why um, compelling someone to actually like functionally comply with the relinquishment is problematic. I'm hearing some people say, I think I'm hearing some people say, the degree of specificity here is problematic. Um, and I'm not, I guess I'm just fundamentally not quite understanding why. Like, I think it depends on what the, what the goal of the order is. And I would argue that in this situation, the goal of the order would be to remove firearms from the person. That would be the intent of what's, what's here. I think what's somewhat problematic about it, and I understand why you would have the further things, and I, uh, but the important thing to comply with, to stay in with the intent of this section, is lines three and four. After that, you're creating a situation where a person faced with this while complying with the order and allowing law enforcement to remove firearms from the premises could still be in violation of this emergency relief from abuse order. Guns are now out of the situation, but they are, they are in violation of it, and that's a crime, because they at that moment did not want to sit down and have a conversation about 
all this stuff. So a, a, a reaction that could happen that, you know, at, at face value would be unappropriate and, you know, is so police officer shows up, gives me this order, and I say, they're in the house, go get them. I need to go take a walk. Like, surprised about this happening because I wasn't there, I didn't know the order was happening. But I don't want to sit down and have this conversation with this officer at this point because that may escalate the situation even more. So I have now walked away but told the officer they can go in, consented to say you can go in and take the guns and they're in the house. But having an arrest me, I am now guilty of a crime. And I think that's problematic. And, and, I, and I think you're trying to get at the idea of the, you just stripping it down to the core principle, the idea of saying, what is the intent of this? It's not to catch someone in the technicality of did they have a conversation with a law enforcement officer. The intent of this section is to get the guns, get the firearms away from that person. And lines three and four are the only two that actually require that. So, so, I mean, it's trying to incentivize cooperation, essentially. Is, mm -hmm. So what can be the incentives for doing that? And, and the one here is that if you don't, you're in violation of the abuse uh, protection order. Um, I, I'm not terribly troubled by that. I mean, it's, if the person cooperates, they're fine. If they don't, they have to remove the firearms uh, by bringing in a safe cracker or whatever and, and such, you know, so be it, that's fine, but the individual can potentially be charged. Potentially, it doesn't mean it's going to be charged, but could be charged with uh, not following these instructions and therefore not complying with the order. Yeah, well, I, I, I was going to throw out just an idea, which I don't know if I should or not, but I will anyway. I mean, if we're looking for an incentive, whether whether this helps you or helps this situation, if language like this is included and specifically uh, it's it's made a, a civil infraction instead of a misdemeanor for not complying with that component of, of such an order. Um, you know, the other stuff definitely criminal offenses. If you violated the vacate or you haven't you haven't provided the firearms, you haven't stayed away, etc. You know, those definitely. But if this one seems like a, a lower thing and we still want the incentive, do we do we do we and can we? I, mean, I guess it can we question for Eric. <clears throat> have that just as a civil infraction. So at least it's there uh, for that incentive. <laughs> so mine's just another little technical thing, but do we need to ha even have the location of firearms on line 7 if it's in section 1 of page 10, which says in all, all available information regarding the type and location of the firearms? Uh, Think that that or is that being reported to a different person? Correct. Right. So, yeah. And who is that being reported? Well, the, the, that has to be, the order has to include all of them over. In other words, what the plaintiff brought to the court in the affidavit and said, I think the, there's two firearms, you know, uh, in the living room, mm -hmm. cabin, gun cabin. Um, that's, gotta, that's what that first one refers to, what's got to be in the order. The second one on line three says, requires the defendant to provide law enforcement officer with. So that's a separate requirement, that the defendant has to provide the enforcement officer, I think that's kind of what you're getting at, with uh, the location. For, you know, who knows, maybe there's, maybe there's firearms other than the ones that were in the plaintiff's affidavit. You know, maybe there's two others somewhere else. Um, or even if there weren't, still, the, the, this is an information uh, production requirement on the defendant, whereas the first one, the number one that you referred to in location, that's on the, got to be in the order that the court issued that the, co that the police officer is serving when they get to the house. Presumably that information came from, in all most circumstances, probably going to be the plaintiff's affidavit. Mm -hmm. So once uh, those are finalized uh, at the court level, 
Uh, is the process still the same that they go to the holding stations? The order? The orders. Yeah. yeah, the orders go to the holding station. Okay, so there is some of that communication, you know, component as far as making sure that that information is disseminated uh, expeditiously. And I th think that was what. Um, they were talking about when they were looking at uh, clarifying the data, the data storage piece, uh, because with the new system that's going in at the court level from judiciary, and some of the language was clarified in the form that goes to the you know, Department of Public Safety and the holding stations, that law enforcement actually has to <coughs> use as their information system, it, it, it really becomes um, uh, important that <coughs> that information gets there um, clearly. And, and they, they were talking about uh, some problems with that. And then when the commissioner came in with his redesign, you, you know, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts going on right now. And uh, so we really need to make sure that uh, the pieces connect right. So, so Eric, are you, um, as I said, you wanted to think about the, in terms of lines by the I feel that they still need to think about whether or not there are any combination or any constitutional issues there. Are you still there? Do you need to think about that? No, I think I, I indicated earlier what my thoughts were on it. I don't have anything really to add. Yeah. Yeah. On line 10, the word expedited with what Matt said earlier there and stuff like that. Like, all that stuff there isn't getting. Uh, more and more uh, murk murkier and possibly causing more of an issue. Who knows? I mean, is it is it that kind of a um, that word could be interpreted interpreted in many different ways and about how long it's going to take to do something? I mean, the guy can't, or the, the person involved can't, maybe he's not functioning uh, where he knows where everything is, remembers combinations, blah, 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 and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he's, he's in more trouble because uh, the law enforcement official um, is going to say, well, you, you didn't give me that information quick enough. That is certainly a, a term that's open to some interpretation, expedited. And if you sort of play that sequence out that you just thought about, or that you just mentioned, uh, if, if uh, that happened and the enforcement officer took the position that the person wasn't complying fast enough, then the consequence would be that the officer would have to fill out an affidavit and file a criminal charge that the person had violated the terms of the relief from abuse order, even though they were trying to turn the firearms over, but they weren't doing it fast enough. And then, you know, would a case like that uh, uh, go forward? Would, would a court, you know, accept that uh, as really grounds for that kind of a charge? I don't know. But, but um, that's the case, I think, that the officer would have to make, is that even though the person was trying to comply, they weren't doing it fast enough, and therefore there's this criminal violation. That is, seems like a tough, a tough case to make. But, but technically possible. Oh, before we move on? Sure. 
Um, so we're, we're talking about confiscation right now, and which I think that pretty much covers what, what happened with confiscation. But so guns are confiscated. Relinquishment. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, at this point, law enforcement has them. There's a list made. They're stored, whatever. Um, so as we uh, go through the process, um, somebody gets their firearms back. What happens to the list? The order? Yeah. No, there's a, there's a list of, the, if somebody has 10 firearms, there's a list of make, model, serial numbers and all that that um, that the authorities have and they get their firearms back, what happens to the list? I don't know how that's a good question for the court. What, what do they do with the return, yeah, the, the return to service? I know, I know it's yeah. in the document, but I mean, what the court then, how long does the court keep those returns of service or the orders or are they public documents that stay permanently? That's a good question. I'm not sure the answer. Mm -hmm. Deleted upon return. That's the section dealing with storage and such. It'll be with a picture of your face. What's that? I said it'll be in with a picture of your face. That's the total right? Yeah. So. Facial recognition? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll find out. Okay. Page 11. Page 11. Any comments? We want to strike the word owns on line up. Yeah, line up. <laughs> Technical. Work for consistency. It's being struck in other places when it's with respect to someone else having a firearm on behalf of the, of the plaintiff. What, what does B mean then? Yeah. That's just. Uh, a provision about the form that says it has to include provisions that allow the enforcement officer um, to make a look back at what, actually what you were just looking at. Um, the okay, so it's allowed. To actually, no, that's a little forward. Um, oh, sorry. So it's forward on uh, page. When the language about what has to be in the return of service, and that um, is on bottom of page 13 through the middle of page 14. It has to be accompanied by the uh, return of service, and then on that return of service, the officer has to indicate how many firearms are relinquished, the time of service, and whether the officer has attempted to conduct, contact the plaintiff after service. So those are the only two things remaining, what has to be in the return, and the language you were just looking at, Representative Trevor, just says that the form has to provide a place for the officer to make those indications. So I wrote this question down yesterday, and it's for one of the proposals of the amendment, I think, are related to that section on page 14, because it's being referenced. I'm kind of curious about what, why make eight, why put eight through 10 in there if there's no requirement for that to happen? Where are you looking at? Like who gets uh, page 14 lines eight through 10? Like what is the information that we're trying to get to people? Because the law, if it's for the plaintiff, they would know when the law enforcement officer contacted them. So it, it's not for them. Or would they, how would they know? Because the law enforcement officer would have contacted them. Was that was what, So what's gained by that? What are they? What are they learning? Like, like we could include the number of the the, the license plate of the vehicle that was used to collect it, but it doesn't mean anything. 
I just don't, I, I see it as no value add. Yes. I think it's essentially a checkoff box that law enforcement has attempted to contact the plaintiff. So if it's not there, then there's not really, it's essentially, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a requirement that law enforcement do this. So uh, but certainly by having this in here, it, it is definitely a checkoff box for law enforcement as far as what they need to, to do in return of service. A reminder, perhaps, that they need to contact uh, the plaintiff. Okay, I see your intent. I, I, I see it more of a, of a prompt and a checkoff than it, it, yeah, it's valuable to understand, you know, for the victim to understand whether they tried to contact him or her or not, but I think it's more valuable that we're ensuring that that contact is doing, or that that contact is being made without having this strict requirement that it is made. And having something on a form to check off, well, I would hope, gets the goal of consistency. Can I, can I just speak to the value of informing the victim, I mean, informing the victim that an attempt has been made, it, it means a lot to that victim. Um, you know, generally these people, these victims are, right, right after the incident, are living in extreme fear. And to know that the cops are actually doing something, uh, or at least trying to do something, it makes a world of difference in how how things go about the in those following days. I totally understand and respect that. I'm saying that a yes or no checkbox doesn't provide that comfort. A like attempt at this time or something would be a lot more comforting than it seeing a, a thing and saying check. Okay, what does that mean? I don't, I, I don't know. It just strikes. I'm just not seeing it as a checkbox value. I can see it as a value to say when the law enforcement officer attempted to contact, so that at least there's some information of what did you try to do to, you know, how, how, do, I, how do I know you're out there doing something for me? I think we also, you know, I think we wanted to strike the balance between telling law enforcement how to, you know, how to do their job. You know, we heard about concerns about micromanaging, and at the same time, you know, balancing that with get, getting the information and getting information back to the plaintiffs and, and you know, and the goal of consistency. Mm -hmm. So. No, I understand the intent. I don't agree. Okay. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's more of an intent. Yeah, I just wanted to intent. Yeah. So you went ahead to page 13. No, I was, I was only right. reviewing the, because, because of the the, reference. Because of that reference, right. I wasn't right. jumping this second. No, no, I know. That's what I'm saying. That we can go back to the yeah. letter. Yeah. Okay. Should we back up to the final? Um, Which is the bottom of page 5, 6, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm going to jump. To, I'm going to go back to page ten. Something that came up with from Patrick's uh, question. <clears throat> At the top, lines one and two include all available information regarding the type and location of firearms subject to the order. That may be a little ambiguous. Then I would propose. Let me just throw this out there that we say include all information available to the court regarding the type and location of firearms subject to the order, just to make it clear what we're talking about. There's this information available to me. Does Thank that you. help? Thank you. All right. Does that help? Okay. I didn't have a problem with it before. Oh, I thought I thought you were all right. Well once once I understood the difference of where it was going. Right, but that's the key. I'd rather have that clear in the way. Does it sound like the defendant is, has to go to the court to get that information, or are you just trying to say? Okay. The information for the court. My argument, 
what do you think are that needs to be clarified or is that clear enough? Uh, I, I don't think I've heard any concern from the court or anybody that there was anything. But I do. I agree that your that your phrasing makes it even clearer. Uh, and I would. I would, the way you phrased it the first time makes sense to me. It's going to be the, the order is issued by the court, so it makes sense for it to say if, it, if you were going to say include all information available to the court. And they're the one making making the uh, issuing the order itself. So that makes some sense. I like clarity, right? Is that the type and location of firearms after they've been taken from the uh, uh, from the house? No, that's before. That's when the court when the court is in the process of issuing the order. Yeah. Uh, I think this stuff is only going to be in there if it includes relinquishment, right? Yes. So if you look at the bottom of page nine, if the order, if the order, the court's issuing a relief from abuse order, you know that may or may not include an order for relinquishment. But if it does, then it's got to include all information available to the court regarding the type and location. Okay. So by the time the court, by the time that information goes back to the court, they probably aren't going to be at the location anymore. Uh, I don't know. In practice, I would. I, I think you have people in this room who work in this area more than I do. But my understanding of it is sometimes when they go to serve them, they're right where they think they're going to be. And that's where they serve them with the order. Probably not always, but certainly sometimes. Right. But it is true that they might be, might, might know what's coming and might want to get out of there. Oh, OK, OK. This information is just uh, somebody is saying that here. That's right. There. Right. And they may not even be here or there. <laughs> when they go to serve it, who knows whether they'll be there or not. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. I think any answer goes back to the final order. Um, I think it's sort of the same language. But... Bottom of page six is where it starts. I mean, I assume that there's the same issue that Matt had uh, at the bottom of page seven, that lines 18 to 21, carried over to the next. So it would be kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest the same language change that I just recommended at lines 14 to 15 on page 7, the available information available to the court, just to make that clear. That's different, though. That's yeah. no. Oh, you mean line 14? 14. Oh, OK, gotcha. You don't mean? Yeah, so line 14. Line right, 14. Gotcha. Yeah. Actually, though, there is a that, is, that is not what well, you did it in the final order for was the I thought it was for the affidavit. No, I mean for the emergency. No, I guess it isn't. So uh, well, that's that's in reality where the information is that the court is going to have. Gotcha. Uh, where it's from, but certainly in the final maybe testimony. Yeah. Other yeah. evidence. That makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, that's the same thing. Did you, were you just pointing that out or moving us there? What's that? Were you just pointing us out or moving us to that section? To which we were jumping back to the final <coughs> section, bottom of page six, seven, eight. Okay. And I, I just flagged the fact that it would be presumably the same concern that you have at lines 18 to 21 and mm -hmm. page seven. Yep. And at page eight, lines one and two. So, so on line 14 on page 7, it says includes all available information regarding the type, number, and location of firearms subject to the order. But on that same part under the, um, the, the other one, on 
page 10, it doesn't include numbers. Is that something that you, you want to consistent? Yeah, it should be consistent. Probably, Eric, on page 10, they add number on line. Yes. Nice yeah. catch. I think that would be a good Yep. Or good catch. Or a little bit on fresh or so. <laughs> And also, just one more thing on page eight, line eleven, strike holds. Yep, I have that. One. Thank you. Matt again. Matt again. Matt again. Since we're doing opinions on these sections, I actually, uh, I, oh, I believe in this section. Um, I think more than any other in the bill. I think this is a very compelling case has been made in this section that this clarifies a lot of stuff that's out there, uh, goes to make, um, goes to walk that line between, um, I think, showing a need um, of, of, of safety, but yet um, understanding that we're approaching the right and that this actually um, really uh, gets at trying to um, make people safer in really difficult times. So I actually really like this section of the bill. Um, I will say again, uh, I mean, I don't get to vote on it either way, so it doesn't really matter, but I'm, I, I just continue to be troubled that it's um, joined with section one, which I consider to be a poison pill. What is our definition of possess? Eric. Eric. Uh, I think that's you know, having your uh, physical control, or sometimes it could be constructive possession, um, which means that uh, it's within your ambit of your, um, sometimes say, wingspan. Um, could also, I think, generally speaking. Yeah. 
sections of law in the chapter, but some chapters, including this one, are divided up further into subchapters. So if you say that the immunity applies only to acts made in reliance on provisions of this chapter, subchapter section, you know, you're getting sort of narrowly, more narrow as you go down the progressions. Um, if you just want to uh, have it apply to the uh, relief from abuse order provisions, I don't have it right in front of me, but I think that's in a subchapter that starts with section 1101. Yeah, subchapter one. It's subchapter one. Right. So it's all the, the general provisions are there. Subchapter gets at the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, let's see, line 19, after <coughs> accessing the firearms, that phrase and removing was proposed by the is clarifying. On 19 of page 16? Yes. So after the word accessing and before the word firearms, add the words and removing. So we call accessing and removing firearms. So to be, to Probably one or the only suggestion that would be one or the other. Yeah, yeah, right. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's yeah, but to you don't have to, yeah, to trigger both. So. Right, right, right. 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 <clears throat> Yeah, and maybe I'm just reading it wrong, which is entirely possible. But um, so this is. Law enforcement agencies officers shall be immune from civil or criminal liability. And then part two is returning a seized or relinquished weapon to its owner if the owner is not prohibited from owning or possessing firearms. 
can you ex explain that to me? I don't know why I'm misunderstanding. Uh, as, uh, well, I also just glad you had me reread that because there's another typo on line 16. They're owing, right? Thanks. <laughs> um, the, uh, but what that means is that uh, if the enforcement officer returns the weapon to someone who's not a prohibited person. So they, they took it away from someone who wasn't prohibited and they're returning to someone who is not prohibited? Correct. Then they would be immune. They couldn't be sued for any sort of damage or something that, uh, uh, or even, or even for the fact of the returning it to the person. Someone could later on say, say this person did something to the weapon, right? Say a victim couldn't later sue the officer and say, hey, you should never return that weapon to that person, and you're liable for that. You're negligent for doing that, uh, and couldn't bring that suit uh, because this is providing them immunity. As long as the person they return it to is not a prohibited person. As long as if that person were prohibited by state law or federal law from possessing firearms, in other words, you're convicted of felon, you've been involuntarily committed for mental illness, something like that, that makes you a prohibited person. If they return it to a prohibited person, then they're not immune. Then they can still be sued. Right, because you shouldn't be given one. They sense the idea. shouldn't have them, but right. this is were these firearms seized from someone who shouldn't have been prohibited? Uh, I think be, they've been seized because pursuant to the subchapter, they've been seized pursuant to one of these really from abuse. And orders. then after those have expired, they're no longer prohibited. That's right, unless they're prohibited for some other reason. Maybe they've got some other felony conviction in their background or something like that. In which case, they shouldn't have it in the first place, actually. But <laughs> there's possibly a right. So let's, um, let's stop here. Thank you, everybody. And we will pick back up. Sure. Anybody else going over to um, retail grocers? Watch out. Is the floor starting at the same time? Sometimes those push the floor at the same time, right? Yeah. Yeah, one. Yeah.